So uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Evgeny. Uh, I'm coming from DataBand. Uh, do it like this. Uh, so this is about me. Uh, I, it was a, I don't know, really nice to be invited to this meetup. Thanks, Omid. Uh, so today we're going to talk about observability. Uh, I definitely want to, will want to level up with you, like, what kind of background you have in observability, airflow, all this stuff. So I'll adapt my meet my presentation to vote like, to the level of the group, especially if, if we are not that big group. Uh, so let's start from me, kind of, I'm building pipelines for the last, I uh, don't want to say decade, but 15 years. So I'm building orchestrations, pipelines, something around pipelines, things with runs pipelines, things, with, things that were triggered by, pipeline, by pipelines, things that move that data from one place to another place. So it's kind of what I'm doing on my, like during my work time. A, as a part of my experience, I was in the army doing cybersecurity research, moved into the data, started to do, do a lot of orchestration. A, I was part of the Crosswise team. We were a company six years ago. I was a founding employee there, building again pipeline, pipeline infrastructure, orchestration infrastructure. A, we were very advanced in, like, in, in the domain of machine learning, build, we have built huge pipelines. So kind of all this background, I have started my own company, and now I CTO of DataBand AI. I'm father of two kids, two boys, really enjoy doing all of this. It's all about me, let's move into the, into the stuff. So first of all about DataBand, we exist for the last year and a half almost. We are a seed company, we raised a not so small seed round. Uh, we're going to announce it in a few weeks from now. We are already around 10 people, even more. 10 data engineers, 10 advanced backend engineers. We are building our own product around orchestration, around data pipelines, around observability. We'll talk about it later. And now let's talk about pipelines. So first of all, like you know, it's a meetup, so I also, it's a nice picture on the, uh, in, in, in the presentation, uh, this is the way we see pipelines, especially or data pipelines, the moment we start to build them. Like this, if you ask how you're going to see your project, it's going to be a nice pipeline running something very, you know, that data, moving data from one, one part to another. So first of all, let's also like know who, who is using Airflow on day-to-day -day basics, so like one, okay, me. Uh, who is not using Airflow? Okay, what do you like? Uh, what kind of system do you use? Like, do you do data move, like data orchestration, pipeline orchestration, or just orchestration per se? Yeah. Uh, uh, using uh, Google App Engine for most of our works, and uh, we kind of uh, write manually all the data for pipelines uh, tasks like MapReduce and such stuff. Okay, cool. And how many of you working with data science projects? Supporting them, okay, cool. Oh, so very advanced public here, really nice. Uh, so let's start. So this is the way we see our pipelines. This is the way I see pipeline every time I start to work on it. This is the way it gets when I, you know, after half year, it depends. So somebody you know, get there into after one week. Somebody think that they never get there. Uh, when you ask anybody ar around them, how is it going? You know, it's like this, and. So let's start by definition of the problem. Like what problem I'm trying to solve, what problem we see, like why we need observability, airflow, all this stuff. The problem is that we first of all have a lot of tools. Like even like, you know, during the previous lecture, three completely different domains, a lot of tools, all of them somehow resemble pipeline of the data and we need to get all of them together. So Spark, TensorFlow, Python, SQL, different kind of operators, clouds and stuff like that. And then it comes to the data. We have all kind of data. It's not like we have all these tools and there is a one common API that calls data. Data is different. They have SEMA changes, you have versions, you have all, all kind of quality of the data. Everything changes all the time. So the data is different. And then during the normal project, the source of the data starts to grow very, you know, like, you know every startup dreams about the hockey stick in the revenue, so in the, in the sell process. The thing that you go, that you get the hockey stick inside the amount of data, of data sources or complexity of your pipeline or stuff like that, this is definitely happening. So you start to talk to your people, 
they have a pipeline and they start to put more data inside it from different data sources, different tables. It always goes like that. And then the pipeline itself, you know, with the time we don't just sit in the, uh, at our work and rest, we write code. So the moment we write code, the pipeline starts to grow. We start to do more abstractions. We start to put more and more you know, things inside our pipeline. So if you take a look on the data science pipeline in the very beginning, it's always you know, extract, train, validate, something like that. There is different you know, definition, features, extraction, labeling, stuff like that. But it's very, very simple. It's like three tasks in the room. Three, three tasks that can run not even in parallel, and it's good. But then you get to the place that, yeah, we have feature extraction from different data sources. We have transformations, we have model training, we have different kind of validation, we have labeling in all way, and then it's combined to all these reporting systems. So like, you know, we start to get people from, from like, you know, data, from data analysis, and the pipeline grows. And the complexity of the pipeline that we need to run inside Airflow or any other system is starts to be very, very big. And then we come here. It's like my personal experience. I was really fascinated by all this you know, electrical. I, you know, it was a, I was working in Intel once, and people was kind of enjoying their job because what they were doing, they kind of running the simulation. And then the simulation around the CPU, how you like compile CPU is very, very long. So you just go and rest. You talk to your friends. You have a nice coffee, nice break. And this is kind of state that we are getting right now. But the pressure is big. It's not like you can say, guys, I'm running my pipeline. It takes two more hours. It's really long way to debug it. And so I can just go and rest. I have another six different pipelines failing right now. So I'm just doing a lot of context switch. So. The managing of all these systems starts to be not a kind of not a nice kind of not, not the type of job that we signed for. Okay, so let's go into deep into the deeper in like you know, why why it's happening. So why like the moment you present the slide like this and like you know everybody will see it and ask. So how did you get there? Like, why did it happen to you? Like, why are you not a good software engineer? Or don't you know how to write pipelines? Or don't you use any external tools or stuff like that? And at the end of the day, there's a lot of reasons. So if you start to bucketize these reasons, is about, first of all, code change. And code of the pipeline changed. So I need that to change every time somebody wants to put another small feature inside my pipeline. Then code inside the operator of the pipeline changes because you know, different persons working on the data science start to put more code, data, ana data analysts start to put more code, people start to optimize their Spark job, their Hadoop job. So always a huge code change all the time. Usually on that intensive project, there are more than five people working, like 10, 15. So 15 people every day doing Git commits. The moment Git commit is done, something changes the code. So there is one huge thing happening here. Code is changing there. And it's really hard to see it even like through the Git because Git doesn't cover the whole pipeline. Usually, if you ask how many projects you have inside one pipeline, it's always Airflow project. It's always some Spark project like in like Hadoop. And it's some Jupyter notebook with coming by mail. I don't know how, but it's somehow get, getting into your system. So it's a lot of Git repositories. It's really hard to track all the code change. Then the data change. Back to what we discussed. Every time data changes, so it's not like a, a lot of people on, in software system likes to ask likes to ask the question, like, why it doesn't work? It worked yesterday. Or like, who changed the version? And here it doesn't work this way. And like, I never changed my version. I didn't deploy anything new, and still my pipeline is failing. Why? Because data has changed. And it changed all the time. So it's starting from the dead. Some smart guy in some field, like you know, in some big company decided to change the, the, date, the date format, and then they're going to spend one week on it. It can be just you know, IP4 to IP6. It can be just a traffic change, you know, like, you know, IP changes. It can be user agent changes. You can, it can be that your business suddenly started to work with different devices. So you have different user agents. It's going to fail. And it, I won't discuss anything like, 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 you know, like Ad tech traffic. Now it can go into different kinds of data sources. So every time you have this rapid change inside your pipeline. 
and we go about everything change. So this last, this, uh, like, so, so the last thing is uh, it's our code change, it's data change. It, there is change in the, in, the, in the data, and then there is change in the tools that we are using all the time. So right now we respond to the one for zero, well, welcome. And then there is NumPy changes, and then there is changes inside the cluster because somebody decided to upgrade the cluster. So the whole system is kind of really missing the visibility on what happening inside. Okay. So like I think this is actually what represents our day-to-day -day job. So I can imagine my nice pipelines. This is what I do day to day. This is kind of sitting there and trying to to fix stuff, usually. And then if I start to compare how much time I spend on writing new stuff or fixing what I already exist in my, you know, it usually the balance is very like you know, nobody wants to talk about it. It's like don't want to ask. So let's go like so what we do? First of all, we start to create abstractions around what you write. So the first nice abstraction will be let's create a pipeline. Let us not create, write, keep writing some Python scripts or some Spark jobs and stuff like that. Let's create an abstraction that will be called orchestration. It will run our pipeline. And then we can use it for, I can know, for, for any kind of use. For example, like, you know, we've omit, we have seen, I can use it even for distributed computing, running all these queries, because it, make my, you know, it makes my life simpler. I can use it for, I, know, I have seen Airflow usage in, pay, in paper, like they, they manage the Hadoop cluster by Airflow. So it's interesting because this is kind of you know, using Airflow DAG, they can remove the node from the cluster and then the second operator is, will put a new node inside the cluster. And then there are like, you know, Airflow that is used for machine learning processes or for data processes. And so we use it. So first of all, like, you know, if you want to get any kind of observability on data pipelines, the first answer would be don't look to any kind of system that start to use some well-known orchestrator, orchestration tool, Airflow, Luigi, Azkaban, it's old, old school. Then there's a new school, Metaflow, Daxter. Uh, right now, Lyft has released another one. Uh, it's Flight, F-L-Y-T. And there are many more. So if it, if it does go and take, take a look on the GitHub, how many abstractions people are using every day, it's a lot. And the first rule of thumb is use some orchestration framework inside your work. Don't try to do simple things to reinvent the wheel. So, and now let's talk about Airflow. So Airflow, why we use it? First of all, it's flexibility. It's really easy. Everybody knows that you can just wrap operators. A, like, you, know, you can write your own operators. You can use existing operators, so you use it. The second thing is, thing is the scheduling. So like, it's not only about the running the pipeline, it's about the scheduled pipeline, so we use Airflow for scheduling. Then we say community. It's like, so we discuss, so it's definitely good for scheduling, it's definitely good to run what I do, so what tools should I select? Right. Many of them probably you select Airflow because you also believe in the community. They say there is a project, it's 15,000 stars on the GitHub. It's really nice, it's doing the job. Why should I, I know, look for anything else? Uh, and then the maturity, I think, no, it's the oldest tool that has survived so far. It's like it started from, I think, 2014. It's a, it, was the, it, it was the beginning, then it was released to the open source. So it's like five years, that's working, doing the, the job. Maybe a lot of internal problems, but it, it does the thing. Okay, so now, well, any questions so far? No. Somebody want to share the you know, story about the pipeline? <laughs> cool. Uh, so the question about the airflow, does it, solve the pro does it solve the problem? I think a lot of people who was looking for orchestration framework three or five years ago, they decided to go with airflow because it provided a really great UI. Then the main developer of the Airflow, Max, he was a really good a UI developer. He was coming from Facebook. He knows how to create a nice UI, not just being a great backend engineer. He was also a great UI you know, front-end developer. So if you take a look on the Airflow, it didn't change so much for the last five years on the UI, UI UX side. And it provides a really, a really nice UI. You go into the Airflow, there is nice tree view. 
There is a lot of trends. There are a lot of uh, you know, visibility on every, in every item inside the, inside, the, inside the database. So writing it on your, on your own is really hard. Uh, but wait, yeah. But, but where, is, so, to, so where is the problem? Why? It's provide a visibility only on execution level. It's like you can see inside the airflow what's happening inside the pipeline when you run something. Like it runs or it doesn't run, but it's really hard to understand what's happening inside. This is the first thing. And the second thing, it's also very hard with the airflow to do zoom out of what's happening. It's really hard to understand like what the overall status of your system. For example, how much cost you are spending? That's a good question or what exactly things are running right now. And there's also like, you know, other problems that we probably will not cover you during this lecture, how to convince other people in the group use Airflow, who, like, how, how, to, how to use Airflow for people who is not production engineer. How, for that, like, how data scientists can use Airflow, how data, that analysts can use Airflow, a lot of questions here. So regarding the observability, Airflow is a nice one, but it probably doesn't do everything that we need. And we start to solve it, okay? So what, what our solution? First of all, we have an airflow. Uh, we have a lot of jobs inside it. We, it runs. And usually people say, great, I have a working airflow cluster. And then you ask, did you connect it to Grafana or to Kibana? There is a, an option inside Airflow to enable stats the reporter, then stats the can go to Prometheus, to Grafana, to whatever. So how many of you have enabled stats the inside Airflow? So it's like, some, maybe, maybe it's right, I think, at, at least. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so here's, so, so, so here it comes, just think about it. Like, you know, every other software engineer who have a microservice, he deploys microservice to production. What he does, the first thing, he connects it to the, some monitoring slash alerting system. And it's okay, no, fine. Now we go into the, our real production system. Airflow starts to be the production system because it's actually do day-to-day -day job. If, like, you know, if for some reason you don't get all this data, I don't know what, like, maybe it's not that critical, but it's kind of critical. Yeah, so, and so you have to get some visibility on what's happening inside existing production systems. So again, this is probably not the best solution, but this is the solution. So to connect Airflow to Grafana and Kibana as an as operational system is a great thing. The second thing usually people do, they start to connect the jobs. We, we talked about it in, in a moment, the business logic of the jobs into the Grafana. So again, you probably inside the organization don't have any other tool except Grafana, Kibana, or something else, Graphite maybe if you are really starting from the few years ago, yeah. But uh, this is what you have. So how, like, no, this is the, so if it's the only visibility, so let's use it. So we connect. And then it goes into the logs. So usually, if you run on cloud, Airflow can, you can configure Airflow logging system to use S3 or different kinds of backends. Probably you have done it. But is it good enough? So it's the same, it's the same question. You can send questions and answer. Like if we decided Airflow is our production system, we connect it to the all kind of other systems. So you can define, Airflow has a nice way of redefining the logging system. Does it means you can do whatever you want there. There is a variable inside the configuration. You can just go and change that variable to be whatever you want, like in any dictionary you want. And that dictionary actually defines your logging system. So. Probably if inside the organization there is already logly, logs.io, you know, Cora, Cora Logics, Big Panda, whatever, you know, so, so many companies that do logging. So connect to it. It's going to be much more easier to do some report that says how many different kind of exceptions you're having at this exact moment. And it's a good thing. And then it's all, let's talk about alerting. Uh, how many of you have alerting on top of Airflow? Oh, nice. That's great. What do you use? We, we use the internal uh, system. Ah, okay, cool. So you can connect to the internal system. It's a good thing. <laughs> Other stuff, uh, you can connect to the to, to some alerting system. The moment you connect it to Grafana, you already can apply some Grafana alerts. 
the moment you start to export things with StatsD, you can connect alerting system to your to your Airflow cluster, and you better do it now than later. And it's kind of it's it's layers. You don't invest right now in this. That means you're creating a huge technical debt for generations to come. Yeah. So this is what kind of production engineer approach. This is the this is this is the thinking that production engineer will like you know, will go through when he see like you know coming his move just move from one from one from one unit to another. And so yeah, guys. So what do you use Airflow? I do my job. And he connects all this stuff, and do. this is one approach. This is a nice approach. Does it solve the problem? Probably not, because now you, we got very operational Airflow cluster, the trans. The Airflow itself doesn't fail anymore. Oh, it maybe it fails, but I have an alert, so I go and fix it. It doesn't help me to fix my pipelines. My pipelines are way above it. It's a business code that fails. It's Spark that fails. It's all other stuff that, that fails, airflow will work. But this is the base, baseline that we kind of we need to achieve. Then we go into the data science approach. So there is another guy who's saying, guys, I, I, I got it. Like, you know, pipelines are failing. I know what to do. And he's going to solve it on his own. He will start to put more and more reports inside the Jupyter notebook, for example, if you have a Jupyter notebook inside, inside the airflow. You, do you see more and more kind of side effects inside the scripts? We write some nice diagrams with the Matplotlib or some other library. You probably said that engineer will never see it, but he knows he, he knows his stuff. So probably the, the moment he moves script to you, he does disable all this reporting system. But they solve it this way. So they start to instrument their code to gain more visibility on what happening with the data. Okay, and then even okay, coming to your example. You're going to write, write some operator that does something on fetch data from the internet. Usually, like you know, if you are Airflow owner, so you write something that you get into the Airflow log and you'll do something. But anybody else, I have no idea what this part of the of the software will run under the Airflow. So they do on their own. They just you know report to different kind of systems, create different kind of different kind of reports. You will never see this report inside the Airflow. But at the same time, it's the beginning of, the, of, of some change. So if you want to gain observability, you just you go to everyone in your group and say, guys, so whoever is a backend engineer, you connect to the production, Grafana, stuff like that. You start to talk to a data scientist and explain to them, guys, it's like, I'm spending most of my time debugging this, this thing, and it still doesn't work. So the only solution we can have is kind of first solution. Let's re-implement everything from, from the scratch. There is always no. Somebody saying it, you know, let's write everything from the beginning. Usually it doesn't work. So the second solution, incremental improvement. Incremental improvement, it just means we start to write software. So take two, we just start to talk to data science. Say, guys, please provide more reports. Write more. You, you write some big query. I want the, at the end of the big query, another query which will do the histogram. So I'll see the, 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 the distribution of, of the data. If you have some query that filter the data, Spark job with filter the data. We want to see all filter results, like, you know, like the counter at least. So the next time I'm going to debug this pipeline, I know that this job has filtered half of the data, or maybe 30% of the data, or maybe next day 5% of the data. So I'll see this metric and I'll be able to say, guys, something wrong with this pipeline. Okay. And then there is number three approach. It's somehow like, no, it's something in the middle that says, OK, we got the problem. I understand there's, there's, you know, there's a huge pipeline. It doesn't work. Production engineer have already connected everything to the production systems. Data science have done everything on his side. You know, and now I start to work. So usually you start to re-implement Airflow operators. This is, like a, this is the beginning. <laughs> you start to write your own Airflow operator. Because you want to be in control, in charge of the old data that comes in. During the run of this operator, you want to see what's happening with the systems. And it's, it usually happens, right? So it's like, yeah, we have Airflow Spark operator inside, you know, inside, the, inside the distribution. Some guy three years ago has implemented it. He was really nice to contribute the code. So we started to use it from the beginning. But it doesn't mean that I need to stop here and say, OK, so my whatever, my Kubel integration to to Spark, like a Kubel Spark operator, doesn't support 
fetch of the it doesn't know how to fetch metrics from Kubel. It's not the way you know, to solve this huge problem. The way to solve this huge problem is say, okay, nice implementation, really great. I'm going to at least inherit from that for, from that operator, and then wrap the run function with the code that will fetch all Kubel metrics. And this this thing will make my life really better, much better, because at that point of time, we starting to connect what's happening on the business level with what's happening on the operational level, like in Airflow, into one, one system that can actually observe everything what's happening. Okay, so at least I will go to the log of the Airflow and see all this stuff. A question so far? No. Let's keep going. So and then. on the data level, which of the approaches So what? Changes in the data that crashes your. Uh, so I mean, which, which of the three personas, ops, data science, and the engineers, the data engineers, are more oriented to solve data problems? E, for my, for, from my experience, it would be like it's very, it's le like I really want to categorize people like on different roles, but it's more like about there is always one person in the organization who is really care about, like you know he. He he's so egoistic and he so likes he he likes his his life so much, so he's really worried why he's spending so much time on debugging things. So he starts to improve, and and then usually you know, usually the guy who really know how to improve it it's a, it's kind of the it's the role of that engineer, because he kind of transferring the requirements by data science into their code. So it's kind of it's part of his job to do all this type of of infrastructure. And usually, what I see right now on the market, people start to treat that engineer more like an you know, like an operator of the pipelines. So we need to find that engineer, so he knows how to run our Spark jobs. And my opinion here, definitely my opinion, like you know, it's only my opinion. We are so immature in all these infrastructures, so he will have to he will like, he will have no other choice but to write more and more tools around what he what we have right now to make all this all this. Happens so it's like it's about you like you know you run once you see something wrong you go and write your own operator and again it's also requiring understanding on the organization level because if a kind of organization says yeah guys but if you already have you have best cloud in the world and that's not not I will not say the name on the on on, on camera yeah, but let's assume there is some best cloud in the world and now you have an Airflow and now you have that and we have Grafana so like. No development. We just go productize the thing and things should, 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 should work. So let's talk about data here, like in, in Airflow. Airflow doesn't have an idea about the data. It have no idea about the data that you run right now. It does. It can do some wiring using XCOM, so it definitely can wire one output of the task to another one. Some, but some, some guys can abuse XCOM and put real data into into XCOM, and then your database will will fail. But from the perspective of the data, you write pipeline, you write A, step A, step B, step C, you don't write the data wiring. It's like it's on you to implement all this migration. And this is why like in Airflow, it's especially you know, useful to develop your own operator. So from what I have seen in different big companies here in Israel, like on Tabula, similar web, stuff like that, I think I can say this on camera. Uh, they usually, like, you know, usually people there will implement their own operators. The operator will be kind of will start to connect compute like clusters, they start to connect to the data, so you can see what happens inside the data. And you, as a data engineer, with actually operate Airflow, can change, you know, can change the way system behaves in, in a very fast way. Okay, so this is uh, so this is take number three. Usually, no, it's like it's it's a lot of iterations. Right now, you come from some meetup and say, guys, I understood what the problem. I need to go and connect Airflow to the Grafana. And then you connect to the Grafana, and after two weeks, you say, you say yeah, that guy was wrong. It doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't work. My pipeline is still failing. So you do, do you go and do something else and something else. So it's all about prioritization. So first of all, let's at least discuss like, you know, what can we do. Then you, dis you decide for. Every one of you, like you know, what 
they, be, they will want to do next. Maybe they will say, our pipeline is the best. We don't need to do anything else. But it's a lot of iterations around your pipeline to create, to create a really nice operational pipeline that actually works. And I, like my, my point here is like, it's usually a lot of people work hours spent on, on, on this stuff. Yeah, so. so back to the mix and match. I think you need to understand your, your customer. It's like is the, the it's it's maybe goes a little bit out of the boundary of the observability discussion, but nobody talk about it during the data meetups a little. Uh, everybody everybody like to talk about the cost optimization. Now it's it's important, and then everybody like to talk about stuff like uh, here we use another nice database. It can run queries ten times faster. Really great. And it actually runs on GPU, so we can discuss GPU. And then we have another discussion about that, that, that data science discussion, that's very important, but again, it's not a data science discussion. We let's talk about, like, you know, these pipelines, actually, they combine all kinds of people. It's like the, the, the people who touch this pipeline, who have to see Airflow pipeline, usually, it's not just one role, it's a lot of roles. So when you start to develop something around this pipeline, it, really hard. It's, it takes time to understand that data science will have to get access to this pipeline. They will have to see what's happening there. Like, there is no way that, you know, that inside your organization, like, you, know, you have a huge data pipeline, and the only guys who can see it are data engineers or data ops team. It's starting to be really crazy, like, you know, like I'm, I am data science. I am kind of in charge of all this algorithm. I know how to do this, how to split data, how to train the model. I have done stacked models, so I have another model training after that. And I don't see this graph. I have to see this graph. So first of all, let's onboard data science to use all this system. Then it also goes to the, to the DevOps guys, back to the, all this production stuff. It's, like, it's not like I am right now that engineer, so I actually live in a nice world, so I, don't, I can get no like, root root permissions on the cloud, and I can do whatever I want. I can spin off Spark clusters. I can run another Kubernetes. I can deploy Airflow there. It's like there is a huge DevOps team inside the organization that actually works, and you somehow need to onboard them to the Airflow, for example. And a great way to do it, approach number one, say, guys, we have a really nice task for you. Let's connect all this stuff together. You don't need to understand anything inside that engineering. You don't need to understand even well. What pipeline is it? Because usually, like we don't, like I, I, not, I myself not acknowledging that. Usually, I talk to people. I say pipeline, 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 and orchestration, orchestration, orchestration. And then the definition of the pipeline, the orchestration is so different for every and every role. Okay. When we talk pipeline to data science, they think about NumPy pipelines because it exists, and this is what we have seen on the previous meetup about data science. When we talk about orchestration to DevOps guys. They will think about Kubernetes because this is the orchestration system of, of stuff. And so find your like, no way to communicate all these problems to, 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 to other guys in the team. And then you can start all this discussion about the observ observability. So it's like now we are, yeah, yeah it's a lot of time. So observability, a metrics. It's, it's the thing, it's probably, it's, we don't need to invent the wheel here. Metrics, 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 this is what solved the problem. Observability in Airflow, so the moment you connect to Grafana, the moment you start to just print metrics to the log files and collect them in any way, this is the way to go. Especially metrics for, from, from the data, this is the, this is the most important you know, stuff in every and every production system. It's even like, you know, when you fetch 8,000, documents from internet, having a simple metric that says what the size of the document that you fetched, and then being able to aggregate that metric, and then say, at the end of the job, I have fetched 20, 20 gigabytes of the data, and I know the distributions, like you know, outliers and stuff like that, it helps. It helps understand why this pipeline took so long, why, what's happening right now. And the moment you can put all these metrics on top of the graph that you are using, it's like it, it makes a difference. Okay, then we go into the, all this compute integration. So Spark, TensorFlow, TensorFlow, and stuff like that. 
all these tools already like in this year have a nice reporters to connect to. So if you talk about Spark Resume, nice reporters, you can extract metrics from every, every and every simulation and somehow get it inside the airflow operator that you are using. Same goes for the TensorFlow, same goes for any other external tool that you're going to use. Yeah. And then after we have done if all this a lot, like you know, we, we kind of we bring all these metrics together. What the next step we need to do? We need to find a way to absorb all these metrics. So what we do? Usually, production people will say, yeah, you can go to Grafana and build whatever dashboard you want. Right? This is what we hear. The thing is, our batch, <coughs> our jobs are not microservices that runs 24-7. Usually I run some batch job inside Airflow once a day. I run it in the morning, then I, I doing, I'll do my regular job, and then next day Airflow pipeline will run again. So the Grafana, it's a nice way of comparing stuff, but what I will see, for every and every metric, I'll get a nice graph. One dot and dot, another dot here. So what should I do, should I, should I do next? So what, I should, what, I can, what we usually do, we start to build one-to-one -one comparison tools. So it's like being able to compare one job to another is a huge observability point. Like, you know, it's like usually people who does data science, they used to this kind of tools. They call it experimentation management. Or like, you know, in the beginning it was just an Excel sheets. And now it's like experimentation management that you can do, the, do stuff. So we should start to use the same using you know, for airflow pipelines as well. It really helps. Again, then you have one pipeline of one operator, not so much no help. Then you have a pipeline of 10 operators that do stuff. Being able to compare one, one by, side by side, it's a huge difference. And then develop, yeah, dis discuss it, so let's not go. A, just a small, like, you know, I start to do a recap because we're already, like, you know, 20, 20 minutes left. So first of all, we need to understand the difference between operational metrics and business metrics we have in our system. Stasdy, all this stuff from the airflow will provide operational metrics. It will not, you know, it's, it's a nice thing. It will make our cluster stable. It will not help us to debug data job. A, with airflow trends usually helps something at some like you no know, who how many people who use airflow use airflow trends nobody there is trends there's nice screen so usually people don't use it but it's kind of it's it's very good signal to understand that something wrong with your jobs because the the line of the execution time goes like this and now you have a real proof of that that uh, tomorrow it will go a little bit more, and then you will, no, not the camera, but you will not hit your SLA, and then somebody will call and say, so what about the data that you have to create for that team, because they're waiting, you know, it's a business process. So trends really helps. It's really hard to understand from the one point of view of, like from one metric what's happening, trend is nice. A, there is uh, also like inlets and outlets inside Airflow. Nobody uses it, so it's an old feature. I don't know how many of you use it. Any? A, you need to understand when you start to provide to things to Grafana that the way you're going to define a key for your job is going to change everything, and you need to understand the the x-axis, like, you know, the, 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 this line because. It's different, like, you know, we production engineers usually talked about the execution time. We talked about the time of the data. So creating a right Grafana board that actually shows the timeline, not the time of the job, but the time of the data that was processed inside the job is very important. Like, how many of you I can understand the difference between what I'm talking right now? It's like, the, I, I'll, give another, I'll give another, I'll give another ex, ex, example. I have a scheduled job that should process reports from yesterday. So the execution time of this job is today. The scheduled time of the data is yesterday. I can know I'm processing like schedule time today, but the time of the data is yesterday. So if I'm going to run the job today, 
is going to be shown on a usual board today. If I'm going to run this job tomorrow, I'll see the results tomorrow. What I really want to see, the dot that represents yesterday data, is the yesterday x coordinate on the graph. Because this is the way for me to build a nice dashboard that represents how my data changed over the, over, the, over the time. Not over the execution time, over the time, like, you know, the real time. And this is uh, something to think about. Uh, let's move forward. We are 15 minutes left. And the last one, I think, to, like, to summarize, we can talk a lot about the observability, about how to define the graphs, how to get visibility into the operators, how to get visibility into the Spark clusters, into all this stuff. It's great. The thing that is like, you know, always left for the, like, you know, for the last mile, for the last step, is alerting. And actually, we say, yeah, it's alerting. But no, this is the thing. Alerting is kind of it's an automation. So in order for all our work to be really effective, and not really effective for ourselves when we have a time to review the report, to review the job, and stuff like that, for the whole team, and also check that our alerts not broken, our metrics not broken, is alerting. Because the moment you define a really nice alert, you define it. You spend time on defining, you remember that meetup, or maybe some different meetup medium post, you remember that they, you know, how they described the dashboard that you, need, that, you need, that you need to get, and you do this dashboard. You create all these metrics. You build the report. You don't have alerts. I can, I can, um, right now, there's no big value for beer. You can get it every meetup, any meetup, but I definitely say, you know, I can, we can talk with, the, the, I, can, I can, I can be the beer that, in two months, this report will not work. Our system will change. It's not on the production no critical path. Nobody cares. It will fail. And the only way to keep all this stuff going and you know, help you to do it, alerting. So you did the metrics. You connected to stuff. And you didn't define any simple alert about all this, all this business file that you have created. It probably will not work in Huffy. May there is different cases. There is definitely somebody can take a, tell the story. We have reports. We review it every every week. I think for every su successful story like this, there is ten other stories that actually people have done a nice job, and it does come into the dev null somewhere there. It exists, but you need to create alerting. Okay. Yeah. So Slack channel, nice thing. Whoever used to use Slack, especially it helps you to start understand your alerts. Uh, who, like, whoever can like, like uh, what kind of alert system you have inside the organization? See, it's like it's a, so it's, a, it's so it's a good question. So if you don't, what kind of system you have, you will not you will never connect, and you will never ask because it's something out of your comfort zone. And then it means the system is going to write like, you know, again. Assuming with all of us writing pipelines, right? So you do something else, it's, uh, it's different. But if you write pipelines, and we talk about observability of pipelines, so if you don't know what the alerting is, it means that you're not going to connect. You will not think about alerting when you define this metric. And then you start to be kind of back to the first slide, huge system, nobody understands what's happening. Again, great job security. But when the job is secured and you're working, you don't enjoy this time so much. Yeah. Uh, so wo what we didn't discuss, cost, we didn't touch at all. It's, it's a huge discussion around how can we track the cost inside our pipelines. Uh, we didn't discuss alerting because it's like right now we, like, no, I don't know how many of you are doing data science, but we do data science. We can recognize trends. We can do all the kind, all kind of clustering al al algorithms. So we also have a lot of data inside our own pipelines to do all this stuff for ourselves. It's a different discussion. And then we, like, we less discussed how can we make organization work than somebody defined like production observability 
that the same observability works for everybody else inside the organization. So that a scientist, then he's running his experiment, he can use the same system. We didn't discuss that at all. Uh, what we did discuss, observability. We discussed to invest in observability right now, like you know, investing.com. So it, I'm not sure if it's a good uh, way to invest in observability, but <laughs> I have no idea. But they invest in observability. It's like it both makes your life simple. And this is probably this is a differentiation between just doing your job like on junior level and then moving it to the senior level and say, guys, I know this is an investment not for now, but overall with the time is going to match the product is going to be much better. And the last thing, sometimes it's definitely good from connecting external systems. It always helps. But start that's by, by writing something simple, POC. You iterate over this POC. You write metrics, and then you start to understand what kind of external system you need to create in order to gather all this stuff. So it's not the, the, not the first thing when I always can come for some, you know, from, us, from, some, from some nice startup. I say, yeah, guys, so we can have this kind of database, and it will solve a lot of issues. Actually not, because if I till now didn't build any prototype, any, any POC around this domain, that database will, be, 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 will, will, will not help. So if you're already using Airflow, it's a nice thing. Let's use Airflow. Let's write some operators, extract data, and stuff like that. If you're using different kind of, of orchestration system, use that orchestration system. If you don't use orchestration at all, it's a good time to start with orchestration. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I can give you a few examples, some examples from DataBand, because this is the thing that we are doing. Uh, it's more like an example, though I'm not running like full demo here, uh, but I'd probably also like by discussing all this stuff, we can, I will cover some things that I forgot to tell. Uh, before I start, uh, any questions so far? about the metrics, about the alerting, about... Yeah, I have a nice guy here. Let's talk about companies who just started out with their data department. On what point do you recommend start talking about observability as a way, as part of your working processes? In the beginning, from a specific point? Yeah, so my... So you can, as, my suggestion would be, first of all, like, no, you, 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 you probably have seen it a lot. You need to have some nice guy, advisor, senior in the group, somebody who can at least explain why it's important. And then for every point of the time, it's, it's better to use something. So yeah, I started, I start, if right now like, I will start some, with some data science project, so I'll start to use, first of all, a lot of open source. So there is Suckert, there is MLflow, there is many others, and then there is cloud tools providers, you know, SageMaker, stuff like that. So if I do anything with, with data, with the Python, I can use the tools. The integration that takes to, the time it takes to integrate the tool is relatively small. So this is a good, it's, it, it's already beginning. So actually, instrumenting your Python code that runs stuff. Then we talk about Somebody who do pipelines, who do more like, you know, like, you know, a lot of operators, Google Cloud operator, big, big, big query operator, stuff like that. So even when you run the queries, starting to have a queries with kind of visibility inside your data. So it's like everybody understands that they need to run a query that will transform data from one source into another. But at the same time, it's also important to write a query that just will create a report on top of your data. That's simple. Again, it's not requiring any other tools. So you're ready from the very first step. I got some data source, and I probably use some query to discover what I have inside it. I can formalize that query into the operator. Airflow, nice tool, nice DAG. Let's call this DAG status of data source, and start to run it, start to run it daily. Until the costs don't hit us, we keep doing that. Then somebody you come and say, guys, you know, it's very expensive. But it depends. Usually people like you, whoever runs on-prem, you have, it's just, it's just about the tuning, you know, 
extracting the, the right queue inside a dupe cluster to submit your job and it will run. But having this kind of visibility is really great. And it's kind of, it's, it, it's built the culture inside the organization that says, guys, we know what we're doing. It's like we have visibility, everybody has this report. So business like to talk about being data-driven. I assume we can do the same. We can say we are also data-driven. We make decisions based on data, so it's very similar. Okay. okay. Uh, any other questions so far? Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying about managed airflow on Google or Amazon? So there are right now, I think, only two services for managed airflow. It's Google Composer and uh, it's not managed service. It's like more like de managed deployment, Astronomer AI. Uh, again, they solve operational part of the airflow. So you, sh it's like, so the, the, the thing that you need to create to connect your airflow to the production, I don't know, to, 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 to the Grafana to monitor the cluster start to be from the first priority to the third priority maybe. But it doesn't solve all the issues inside the airflow regarding the, the, the deployment. You're still writing the airflow. You're still writing all these docs and stuff, but it's still very hard. To, so the deployment is very hard. Writing the docs is not that easy. It doesn't solve 90% of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem. And also, the way Airflow is built, it's like it's very sensitive to the Python environment you run. So saying Google Composer, it's, it's a nice thing. But it's, when you're on a very basic level, it's so like, you know, definitely let's use it. The moment you go into much more advanced usage of Airflow, it starts to be a big limitation. So usually, you know, all these services with cluster with clouds provide, like you know, databases, stuff like that, they have very clear and good API, you know, SQL, SQL query language, for example. So it's very easy to integrate. Then you say, let's use managed service for Airflow. It depends, like, you know, it's uh, how you're going to migrate to different version of Airflow. You understand that you need another version of Airflow, it's hard to do it. <coughs> you understand we need to put some plugins. You understand that your virtual environment is different. You understand that you want to run it locally. It's a lot of small stuff that actually, so it's not a bad thing, but it's not the thing that solve everything. Because I have seen kind of places that saying, guys, yeah, only if we could use managed Airflow. So guys, so definitely if you, 100% of your time you're spending on Airflow, so you're optimizing that 2% of the 3%, from 3% to zero maybe, 97% is still here. And the migration, especially when you already have a lot of code, is not that simple. So good thing, whoever can, can use it, probably already using it. Whoever on the boundary probably will use it. Uh, but it's not the solution for everybody. It's not like I see like, uh, right now everybody will, use, will move to hosted airflow and managed airflow and it will work. Can the flow become a performance uh, battle bottleneck in a very big uh, jug when you have like tens of thousands of jobs? Amazing question. Definitely. Yeah. So, so, so the answer right now is 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 the, uh, like, like that. Definitely yes, and it's uh, first of all because it's a Python tool with a scheduler. I can have single. Like, uh, it's not high 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 availability scheduler. It's a single point of failure tool system that is. Scheduler, a schedule written in Python. And then there is a concept inside the Airflow that talks about DAGs, and DAG is some, some Python code in memory. So there is some system that needs to manage inside the memory all instances of Python DAGs you have so far. It's some system that runs like, on single threaded in Python on top of that. And, I, and this I, can, I only started, so this, this, is kind of, this, is, this is problematic by definition, okay? But then it goes actually into the implementation. And the implementation right now, uh, we can just, we, we, inside our product, we use Airflow a lot. And we had done so many, many, many improvements. So we have done this improvement one year ago. Now this improvement finally got in also into the Airflow. It's into inside 2.0. There is, first of all, with the moment we start to talk about a lot of DAGs, like, you know, like 100 operators, like, 10 operators, 100 ducks running simultaneously. There is a huge problem with the database. If you, if you write a profiler of a scale, a scale profiler on Airflow, 
It runs a lot of queries. The reason for it, like it's a numerous problems there. Uh, right now, there is one nice page done by Blue Wine guys from Israel. And his name is Avik High, I think, something like that. I don't remember his name. He fixed probably the, the biggest problem because it was all, it wasn't all of one for, for accessing per DAC, it was like all of n, n square. So the moment you start to increase your DAX, it starts to be for every and every operator, checks that all dependencies are in the right state, and that means all n square, all n square uh, access to the database. And if you have many share flow very close to database, maybe it works. When you have some latency between your scheduler and database, it stops to work, like it works like you know 10 ducks in a minute and it's something something wrong here so airflow community understand that they start to fix it right now guys uh, one of the maintainers of airflow is starting to fix it as well we contributing our call code to fix the schedule as well so it's kind of it, there is going to be a change it's probably if you're going to get to the level it's good enough it's never going to be best enough. But here's the thing, because it's one single threaded, because it's Python, because it's kind of known, exist, and there are so many business rules, so many stuff you can do, you can configure, but usually any other Go, C, or whatever tool don't have inside it right now, and they have it inside the roadmap, Airflow already have it. So there is pros and cons. You, you can say, yeah, it doesn't, but you should not use Airflow for distributed computing. Use Airflow to orchestrate your business process. Then you do distributed computing, and it's nice. You can optimize all parameters, and probably right now it will take less resources. But this tool wasn't built for the, this, this tool wasn't built for the distributed computing in the first place. It was built for orchestrating business process. So I switch to data band. Uh, so first of all, like in, like in examples, the uh, example being able to see, so like small, the small disclaimer here, uh, uh, we are developing this project for the one year and a half. We have customers, uh, we started from orchestration. We know how to convert your Python code into the Airflow deck. It's like you, you can take almost every Python script developed by data science, that in I don't know, whatever person, and we can easily create Airflow deck out of it. It's very resonant with all the new tools, tools that you see, that you have you know, nice decorators, some operators, and you can run the pipeline. We do it for Airflow on our own. We, we, uh, we kind of we improve airflow in many sm different levels. We know how to work with Kubernetes much better and stuff like that. It's some, and all of this we're going to open source in February. Uh, this, is what, this is what we're doing as a, as, as a company. I will not run an orchestration demo right now. But we, let's assume we are good in it and I will not show anything. I will just show some examples what kind of observability you should see inside every and every orchestration framework. Okay, so we are almost out of time. So first of all, it's kind of, if I have a pipeline and I have inside it some tasks, I should be able to go, just go inside and see what's happening inside the Python code. So the first I can also say, guys, whatever code you have, you can drill down and see what's happening inside, what other pipelines have inside this, this code. So it kind of resonates with the, with the, with the subducts. The other stuff, no, so this one kind of was to start, to, make your, to get your attention, yeah? But the real, th the real things. I think the, the one of the most important things that we talk about a lot so far was data. So like what we, what we trying to achieve, we are trying to combine the visibility on the orchestration together with the visibility on the, on the data. So it means I can know every and every input or output that I have. I should be able to see what I have inside it. I should be able to see what kind of theme I have inside it, and stuff like that. 
So the moment you, like right now I have UI because now we are the company, we're developing it, you know, it's like it's UI, but it's not have to be UI. It does have to be inside your code. You have to, you, you have to be able to see a small, small snippet of the data uh, in every, in every job and it will help a lot. And again, if you're not talking about PII data, it's possible to, yeah, so. So being able to see data from every and every step in one place is a, is a great feature. Being able to see, I give an example, another example. Being able to see, let's go here, sorry. No, it's a scheduling. I have something here. Sorry guys, one moment. Yeah, being able to see all my jobs with their metrics all together, it's something really important. So for example, I have DAG with runs now every time. It runs day by day. So being able to see some, in some place in the system, execution, like nine tasks was executed at the time, but also the business metrics all together, it's a huge value for your project. Okay, being able to see how user actually was executing that pipeline, it's a huge value for your project. So that means data science can come in, take a look, say guys, metrics are not good, copy paste the comment and run it on its own. Or data, data analyst or data report, whoever is in charge of this report. It's not, I am always, all the time I'm saying data science. If you do, there's no standard data analytics, it's the same thing. Somebody who have created the report, it runs inside data, uh, inside the uh, airflow, and you have to be, you have to be able to see it. Uh, other stuff, I'm not sure if it works right now, but let's see. Yeah. It works. Being able to compare stuff. So remember that one that I said, you have to be able to put tasks one to another. So this is a nice feature for your pipelines from a observability perspective to be able to say, guys, this is my develop. This is my branch. I am changed a lot of code. This is the branch where we change the cluster. Da, do they look the same? If they look the same, I can up, you know, finalize upgrade of my cluster. I can finalize my feature branch and merge it back into develop. And so, on. Uh, so I think yeah, let's let's finish here. That's eight o'clock, eight eight and seven. So I don't know. Uh, let's uh, I can I can keep talking for another hour, but. Uh, cool, so first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm available for questions right now and after as well. Just write me email, uh, right? Yeah, we didn't, we, didn't go from the we didn't go through the official part, where is the, my presentation? Yeah, data band, sorry. Yeah, let's go back here. So different airflow, some preferences. Uh, we open sourcing our framework that integrates with Airflow and, add, and, and any other, other orchestration uh, in February. If you really want to get access to it right now, just let me know. I can give you access to, to, to see it. Uh, we have a commercial product that talks about observability, monitoring, and alerting inside all this Airflow stuff and stuff like that. And we definitely hiring, so another topic to talk to me. And that's all. Yeah.